All right, we began a journey last week, a new series of messages uh, coming off of Easter Sunday. We talked about what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And one of the things that we said is that a follower is more than just a learner, more than a student in the classroom, more than someone who studies following or uh, talks about following, but one who actually follows. That's what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not a passive uh, lifestyle. It's not sitting, uh, listening in a classroom while information is downloaded. A disciple is a learner who will be a practitioner. In Mark's gospel last week, we read Jesus' words, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that there is a clear calling between the following and the fishing. And you can't separate those two things out when you're a disciple, a follower, a committed lifelong learner and server with Jesus. So Jesus called out some guys. And he gave them an illustration that is clear. And that, uh, even for non-fishermen, fishing Fishing for men. Any fishermen here today? Wow, everybody's afraid. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Some, some of you, you, re- you really shouldn't raise your hand. Uh, but fishing uh, is a real adventure. I enjoy fishing. And I'm going to tell you a story from uh, one of my favorite theologians, Jerry Clower. He told this story. <laughs> Yeah, some of you know Jerry Clowers, you know how that works. And this is how he told it, and, and I'm going to use, uh, I like to choose different states in our union to focus on on any given Sunday when I tell a story. And Because Oklahoma has taken such a beating over the last several years, the things that I've said and done, and I get a lot of mail, I'm, I'm going to choose Mississippi today. Now, uh, and, but just because I want to hear from different people. And uh, again, my email address for any comments you have is jeff.mize at fbcallen.org. And that's where all my email goes. So there's this guy, Jerry Clower tells this story. There's this guy, and uh, we'll call, he's from Mississippi. So we'll call him Bubba because there's a better than zero chance. And Bubba was going out fishing, and every time he went out, he just caught a boatload of fish. When nobody else was catching anything, Bubba caught fish, and, and not just a few fish, but he caught a lot of fish, and to the point that, okay, something odd going on here with Bubba's fishing, and something's not right, and the game warden uh, has been hearing these stories, seeing these reports, and he decides, I'm going to see what's going on, but I'm pretty sure something illegal is happening. So the game warden, he didn't reveal who he was he approached Bubba and said hey I heard you're a great fisherman I'd like to learn and could you be a fishing guide for me and Bubba said why sure join me early in the morning as good fishermen do he went out the game warden in disguise undercover and uh, fisherman Bubba they went out in the middle of the beautiful glassy lake Bubba stopped the boat he reached under the seat He pulled out a stick of dynamite. He lit the fuse. He threw it in the water. Kaboom! Fish just floated up all around the boat. He got his dip net. He just started loading up the boat, as he had done many times before. The game warden was horrified by this. It's terribly illegal to do this. And he says, here... Here is my badge. Here, my credit. I am the game warden. What you're doing is illegal, and I want to, I want to bury you underneath the, underneath the jail. This is so wrong. You can't do this kind of stuff, Bubba. He put down his dip net and he sat down in his boat, reached under the seat, pulled out a stick of dynamite, lit the fuse, just tossed it over to the game warden's lap. He said. Are you going to just talk all morning, or are you going to (laughs) fish? Now, that's what we're going to talk about. Are you just going to talk about fishing, talk about being a disciple, talk about being a follower of Jesus? Are you going to do something that that shows you're a follower of Jesus? So, this uh, last week, we talked about this from Mark's point of view, because the gospel writers see it from different vantage points. Today, we're going to look at this. From the gospel according to Luke, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, 
John, those biographies of Jesus. Here is Luke chapter 5. And here's how Luke tells the story. It's a good fishing story. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he, Jesus, was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Uh, This is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And Jesus sat down. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, this is Simon Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, heavy sigh, Master, we, saw, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is a critical time in the life, the ministry of Jesus, because he wants to surround himself with people who are really, really going to get this. Not, not casual uh, listeners, not even convinced listeners we talked about last week who say, oh yeah, I sort of agree with what Jesus says and what he's about. But, but he wants followers, people who are going to get up and they're going to follow, they're going to do, they're going to be what he's called his followers to be. So Jesus is building followership, uh, an inner circle first of followers. And he doesn't just put the word out there and say, oh, okay, well, here's a sign-up sheet. I'm going to tape it to the wall of the synagogue. Anybody who wants to follow me, uh, sign up here. He, he's, rec- he's recruiting and carefully, and he's offering up some tests of discipleship. What, what does it mean to follow? What's this going to look like? How, how is this going to work? And He's not looking, we said last week, he's not looking just for uh, people who are fans. Woo, way to go, Jesus. He's looking for people who will, who will follow, who are really, there's buy-in and there's commitment. There's in willingness to invest. Disciples who will, who will go out and make more disciples. That's what Jesus is looking for in his followers. So on this critical day, he puts these guys through some key tests. He's starting out with Peter. James and John are going to get pulled into this as well. And what's interesting to me in this story is, because uh, I'm a pastor that talks to people about spiritual things, is the longer Jesus talks, the bigger the crowd gets. I've never had that problem my whole life. It tends to thin out with me. But with Jesus, the longer he talked, the bigger the crowd got. And to the point they're pressing in on him, and you picture him, his back's to the Sea of Galilee. There's no place to go, and people really can't hear, can't see. So, hey, Peter, could, could you get in the boat? Let's go out just a ways. Jesus sits down because as a teacher, he would sit to teach. That meant it was really important when he sat down to teach. And he sat down the boat. Now there's a little space. The sound's going to work better. The visual's going to work better. And he continues to teach the people. Now, this is uh, fascinating because Jesus is comfortable around the Sea of Galilee. He spends a lot of time there. He will spend a great deal of time there. And he could have easily said, hey, you guys are busy with your nets. I'm going to go out and uh, just if I can borrow the boat for a second, I'm going to push out, row out here just a bit, and then uh, do some teaching, then I'll bring your boat back. And instead, he says, Peter, will you row out with me a ways? And, and there are a series of tests because Jesus is trying to, trying to measure some things in these, these guys. Do they have what it takes? Do, are they really, really disciple material? Are they followers or just fans like the crowd? So we're going to run through these and uh, a series of tests. And really, uh, these are all tests that the Lord offers up to us too. Here's the first one in that outline. The first test, I think, is a bias for action test. 
Jesus is not testing Peter's theology. He's not testing his character. He's not testing his intelligence. He's testing his willingness to take on a situation, to jump in and to do something. We, uh, there's a challenge here. There's a problem here. Are you the kind of guy that's going to step in to the challenge? Are you going to lean into the problem? Are you going to see you see if something can be done to, uh, to make a difference? Are you oriented toward action? And Jesus puts this little test out there. And, you know, if Peter had said, seriously, I am worn out. Uh, I've been fishing all night. I'm too tired to do this. Uh, go find somebody else to do this, do this for you. If Peter had said, you know, I, you're a swell guy and all, but I'm not this bought into what you're doing. If, if Peter had given any pushback at all on following we wouldn't know his name today if he hadn't passed this, this first test. But instead, he rises to the occasion. He pushes off, goes out with Jesus, and he passes the first test. Now, here's an application for all of us who would, who would want to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. Do you have an inclination to do something or are you more inclined to, as we said last week again, because all the... This, these three sermons, last week, this week, next week, tied together. Are you more inclined to sit on your blessed assurance and wait for others to do something while you make excuses? When God's call goes out, are we, we more inclined to say, I'm sure somebody else will go first. If I, I'm not raising my hand. I'm not stepping forward. I'm not. And even when Jesus prompts something in our spirit, do we have an inclination to, to give him our yes quickly? And I think Jesus is still looking for people who, who see a need, they hear a call from God, that prompting of, of the Holy Spirit, and they're just inclined. Their leaning of their life is toward yes. When God calls, when he stirs the heart, you just say yes. You don't make excuses. You don't fight back. You don't run for cover. Instead of saying, why? Here's all the reasons why I can't. Why do you say, why not? When it's the call of God on my life, why would I not want to step into that? Here's the second thing. The test is, will you follow, the will you follow direction test. Now, bias for action people, sometimes they'll just run off in a direction. They'll do something, even if it's wrong. They, but, but they don't follow direction. They say, well, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen to what a faith-based community says. I'm not going to listen to what the scriptures say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to make my own agenda. I'm going to make my own plans. I'm going to determine what I think God would like to have from me rather than what his word has declared I should offer up to him. They don't follow anybody's orders. And Jesus is testing Peter to see, we, are you the kind of guy, you, you're, you have an orientation toward action. Are you the kind of guy who'll do what I ask you to do? Who, who will just say not only yes, but yes, I'll follow what you've said. Well, here's Peter, and he's fished all night, and they'd worked hard all night, and they haven't caught anything. And now here's Jesus. Now, Jesus is a carpenter by trade. He's a teacher. He's not a professional fisherman. And he's telling professional fishermen, this is what you do. These guys with their nets, this kind of net fishing, they fish at night because that's, that's how good fishing is done in that environment, that, the shallow water. They throw these nets. They do all this. That, that's why it's daylight now, and they're sitting, and they're cleaning their nets, and they're mending their nets, and they're getting ready because tomorrow night, after a bad night this night, tomorrow night, maybe it'll be a little bit better. And so these are professional fishermen, and Jesus asked him, to do the unthinkable. Okay, hey, Peter, thanks for letting me borrow your boat. By the way, here's what I want you to do. Go out and do all that stuff that you know you need to do at night. Do it in broad daylight. Just go out there right now in front of these people and do the unthinkable. And I also appreciate his response in, uh, in verse 5, where it was partly because it's just so honest. He says, Master... We've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. We did. We have done. We have done our due diligence, done our best. But because you say so, I will. 
because you command it, because you're asking, I will. If you've never underlined anything in your Bible, never marked anything in your Bible, why don't you mark that one? Because you say so, I will. He's struggling a bit, but in the final analysis, he says, because you say so, I will. And his answer is yes. And this is a powerful witness. It's a powerful statement by a Christ follower. That, and again, if Peter not passed this test, I don't think we'd know his name today. This would be the end of the story of Peter in the Bible. Some of you, God's tugged on your heart about things. God's prompted things in you. He stirred things in you. that This is not the way it should be. This is, this is how it should be. Because a lot of us, we're fine moral people. We're not doing what God said to do. We're not living that life of faith that he's called us to live when we're really disciples, when we're really followers. And we said last week, if you're not following, you may not be a follower. That's the way that works. So you've heard that stirring in your spirit. You've had that calling from God. You've read something in the Bible. You've been in a Bible study where someone else has declared, this is what the Bible says. And and you know what you should do. You know what you should change. You know what you should put away. You know what you should take up. You know that you should share your faith. And we all have excuses about why we don't. And the question on this test is, are you willing to just put your yes on the table and say, yes. I, I, wherever he leads, I'll go. We, we're, we're good to sing that, but doing it's a different story for most people who would claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. I'm going to sit right here, but I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to sit right here, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go when you say go. These are tests, and you pass them or you don't. It's pass, fail, and there's so much at stake for Peter. Because Peter didn't know what the future was going to hold. Goodness gracious, if Jesus had peeled back, the, peeled back the curtain of time, and Peter could have seen everything that was going to be happening in the next few years, certainly where the road would lead to the end of his life. Oh, my. But because you say so, I will. And his whole life opens up. And he passes the test. Here's my challenge to you. And I say, it, I say this without hesitation, without apology. Everything God asks you to do, every prompting of God's Holy Spirit, just say yes. Just try it. Just take a faith step and say yes. And, and and I'm not saying you, you can't wrestle with it. Like, oh, no, I got too many. Well, Peter's a pretty good example. He, 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 he wrestles with it. He struggles with the issue. Well, here are all the reasons why I don't think it's going to work out. I mean, it's, I feel this tug. I feel this fear. I feel this obstacle. It's going to hold me back. The key is, is to stick the landing. How about that? Where you end up is going to be so important. And so what he says is not, you can't ever question, but just make sure that I'm wrestling with this, but ultimately it's a faith step. And because you say so, because you say so, I will. You will never regret saying I will, saying yes to God. Here's the third thing. It's the who deserves the credit test. I read a story like this Think, boy, Jesus really did test them on this because business, business was bad. If Jesus had left them with business is bad, uh, it would have been a lot easier to say, I think I'm going to go find another business. Jesus called them when business was great, when they'd had this incredible catch. So Jesus arranges for this incredible catch of fish. And why? Well, it's not just because Jesus thought, oh, those poor guys, they, didn't, they fished all night and didn't catch anything. I need to help these guys out. I think it's about more than them making money on their catch. I think it's the who deserves the credit test. And I think that Jesus is finished teaching. He tells Peter, hey, I'm going to drop me off. You go back out and you do the fishing thing. Well, as long as Jesus is there, the crowd's still going to stay. So they're watching, and Peter does this, because you say so, I will. And he drops down his nets, and this huge catch of fish. James and John are his business partners. They come out and help him. And, and 
I think there might have been a temptation at this point. There would have been for me. There would have been for us often to take some credit for this. You, get, you, got, you have a crowd. You have an incredible success. Against all odds, not the right time to be fishing. And there's all these fish and say, I'm taking some selfies and I'm posting some stuff to Instagram and I'm going to celebrate this. We're fishermen of the year. We're the greatest on the Sea of Galilee. Nobody can do what we've just done. And what's amazing is Peter, in response to this test, instead of instead of coming up and, I don't know, fist pumping his way through the crowd over his catch of fish, instead, he heads straight to Jesus. He drops down at Jesus' knees, it says. And go away from me, Jesus. I am a sinful man. Peter recognized quickly in this situation, and he confesses it openly in front of Jesus and anybody else standing around. I got nothing. I had nothing to do with this. None of my skill set could have ever produced this result. Jesus, he says, you get the credit for everything that just happened out there. And this is a test, and we get put through this test all the time. And it's true in church life, the things we do in response to God's call in our life here. and It's true in family life. It's true in work. It's, we are quick to take credit for things. Instead of immediately, anything, every good and perfect gift comes from above, the Bible says, and to turn immediately our, our attentions toward the Lord and say, God, this is all because of you. This is all you. None of this is me. There's a human nature thing with us that we, we tend to claim credit quickly. Who deserves the credit for successes in life and ministry and family when you're a believer in Christ? Oh, we've got to be quick to credit God. It's by his wisdom, by his power, by it was his idea, it was his strength. And this is a big test. And Peter really did well on this test. He passes it with flying colors. Do you give God credit, God thanks, God praise? In everything. Instead of saying, well, God, thank you. And uh, thanks for helping me out. Thanks for getting, you get the assist on the score that I made. Oh, it's so much bigger than that. The fourth test is the grander vision test. And once the buzz of the great catch, it all happens, you'd think that everyone would just go home and the whole event's over. But Jesus poses quickly another another test and this is the grander vision test and timing is everything in this test so there's a buzz in the air catch the fish how everything is unfolded and Jesus his, his expression to, to Peter Simon Peter James John that was pretty incredible huh well you love that didn't you all those fish all that success something that was so big that you couldn't take credit for it. Something so real, it couldn't have been anything that you produced. It, it's, not, it's not a game. It's something, something so much bigger. Now, and, and by the way, next week we'll talk about the power of, of following together and the values when we follow God together. He said, you guys got to do this as a team. You experience this shoulder to shoulder, this incredible catch of fish. How cool is that? Well, now, if you got that excited about scaly, stinky underwater creatures, what if, what if it was people? A lot of people you guys already know who don't know, don't know me, don't, will not spend eternity in heaven, will in fact spend eternity in hell separated from God. What if, instead of just catching fish, what if, what if you had a shot at, at spending the rest of your the the balance of your life, redirecting, engaging with the eternal destinies of people. What, what if you were turning that around? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be even more fun than catching fish? And nothing against fishing, but you just compare the stakes. You, you bring the fish. They're going to eat a few of these fish. Most of them, they're commercial fishermen. They're going to take these to the market. They're going to sell them to other people. And they're going to make some money. And there's nothing against making money. It comes in handy, right? But 
You take a moment, you compare the value of, okay, here's a making a dollar, and here's eternal destinies. Well, you see the difference between those two things? How incredible. To, to be able to impact the eternal destinies of other people. And he's saying, I want, I want you to accept my invitation to be a part of that work. You, you, want, you want to catch fish, or do you want to catch people? Dollars are destinies. Now, it's important that you understand there's no shaming going on here. This is a test where, okay, well, if you have a job where you're selling stuff, making stuff, uh, managing stuff, teaching stuff, or you're telling people about Jesus all day, then, you know, this doesn't count. This is wrong and this is right. That's not the picture at all. Nowhere in the scriptures is it painted that way. This is a vision test. It's, do you have a heart for the eternal? Do you have a heart for this big, broad stroke picture I am painting? And this is essential for a disciple. And this, this part can't be missing for disciples. Some of you, absolutely, you may very well be called away from whatever it is you do day to day in your, in your work. You may be called away to full-time ministry or mission somewhere in the world. At whatever stage of life, because God calls people a lot of different stages to accomplish a lot of different purposes. Uh, you know, I visited with someone in our church this morning that is stepping away from a job uh, they've been working to, to pursue a calling to ministry. That's a big faith step. So, you know, we celebrate those things. I pray God would always be calling people out to full-time mission in serving Him. But the core of discipleship, the grander vision, is to, is to take your love for Jesus and your desire to share Him and take it to your workplace, to your school, to your neighborhood, to your extended family, and be a part of the grander vision of fishing for eternal souls. And that's, that's the grander vision. And in doing that, be the most dedicated. The Bible talks a lot about workplace stuff. Be the most dedicated employee there. You work hard. You do what you're supposed to do. But there are times, there's a break time, or there's a lunch time, or you're transitioning between place to place, or it's before, or it's after work, or it's, hey, let's meet some uh, evening, or some morning for breakfast. And you get to be a part of the grander vision. And you're always thinking, not just, I make widgets, I sell widgets, I repair widgets, I do bookkeeping for widgets, uh, whatever it is you do in your workplace. But you say, in all of my circles of influence, all the different places, and how many places do you have influence? Well, over here, it's it's those parents that you stand and or sit on the sidelines with at games. And over here, it's, it's this club that you're a part of. And over here, it's your neighborhood. And there are all these different circles that you're already a part of. And the challenge is to join Jesus in the bigger redemptive picture of the needs of those people. Everybody needs to know Jesus. Everybody is lost apart from the Savior and needs to be saved. And that's the challenge of discipleship. Jesus is inviting you to the greater vision. This is the environment where I am to carry out the grander vision. This is my arena of influence, my circles that I function in. And I'm going after the big fish. I'm going after destinies. Th this isn't about necessarily changing vocations. That's not the test. It's about getting it, seeing it, being seized by the grander vision throughout your day. I'm taking responsibilities today. I'm going to do the best in what I do. But the affection of my heart is going to be on the grander vision. And I'm going to be leaning into it all day. Because people are lost without Christ and it has to bother me. And I have to care enough about these people that I spend my day with to desire to maybe spend eternity with them. So I'm going to make some choices about the grander vision. And it's a test. And it gets put in front of us every day. And you have, to, you have to get it, you have to see it, and you have to go after it. But it's the grander vision test. And it's a part of what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, always. This isn't for a, a select few here or one or two there. This is what it means to be a Christian. The last thing, this is the will you leave it behind test. And this is from verse 11. It says they pulled up their boats, pulled their boats ashore, and they left everything to follow Jesus. Everything. Now, again, sometimes 
not often, not regularly, but sometimes God taps individuals on the shoulder and says, I want you to change, change vocations. I want you to move. I want you to do something completely different than you've ever done before. I want you to leave everything you know, everything you've been trained to do. I want you to leave it all. My hand on your life, I want you to follow me, and it's going to cost you everything. And that's a test. But the leave it behind test, it's, uh, this is what I want you to hear about this. God may ask, the big thing of you, but I assure you, when you have committed your life to Jesus, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you're a disciple, God's always going to call you to give up some things. He's going to call you to step away from some things. And we step away from convenience. He'll call you to step away from your comfort. He'll call you to step away from what feels safe. Think, well, that stinks because those are all my favorite things. I live my life to feel comfortable and safe and things to be convenient, he'll call you to let go of some things. And I want to tell you this. Just let go. Just let go. Take a step of faith once in your life. This is the only way you, give, you become a Christian. It's the only way you live as a disciple is you say yes and you leave some things behind. Think about this. Jesus left everything behind. Left the glory of heaven that you might be redeemed, bought back, purchased by his blood at the cross. And if God is asking you to leave something behind to go into a new venture, just know this. He is, he's really stretching your faith. He's going to always do that. Just, just let it go. Look at what God did in the lives of these guys. Ordinary guys. There's nothing uh, overly noteworthy about Peter and James and John. But they were willing to pass the test and... And then there's this multiplication thing that happens because these guys say yes to Jesus. These guys say, I'm going to let some stuff go. These guys say, I will follow you with all my heart for the rest of my life, which is what it means to become a Christian, to enter into a relationship with God. And, and they told some other people about Jesus. And then those people told some people about Jesus. And then they told some people about Jesus. Finally, somebody got around telling me about Jesus. And I've told some people about Jesus. And there's a multi-generational element to discipleship. It's not just about me and mine. It's about, it's about him, his great work in the world. Will you leave it behind? God is speaking to some of you this morning about this stuff. and uh, Stirred some things in you from last week. And I, I just want you to know this fishers of men calling, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The following and the fishing are always connected in Scripture. Those aren't two separate things. Those aren't two choices on a multiple choice test. If you're following, you're, you're fishing. You're reaching out. You're part of the grander vision. You're part of making disciples. And that calling's on all of us. And so I'm, I'm calling you out on this. Yesterday, I appreciate, and I shared with them yesterday morning, I appreciate it, 40 or so of our people, another we did this last month with over 40 people. Yesterday with another 40 or so where we did training. People just said, okay, I'm willing to say yes. I'm willing to be trained and I'm willing to go. I, I, I'm not going to sit and soak. I'm going to do what he called me to do. And if I'm a disciple, a disciple is going to be fishing. And we saw great things. People giving their lives to Christ. People who've never had anyone pray for them out loud. Had somebody pray for them yesterday. And and some gospel doors opened up for further conversations. And this is what we're going to keep leaning into as a church. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to say to you. This will, this will give you great encouragement today. If you're wrestling with this today, but you're still not ready for giving God the yes, this is what I pray for you. I pray that you be stricken with insomnia tonight. That you, you'll be sick at your stomach, miserable, burdened, Worn out. I pray you'll have the worst May 1st in the history of May 1st tomorrow. Until you give God your yes. Because until you give God your yes. Until you, you say, I, I am truly going to do this. I'm not going to play a game. I'm not going to pretend religion is the same thing as a relationship. That, that thinking it is the same thing as doing it. That being a f fan of Jesus... Is the same thing as following Jesus? I want
want you to say, if I really belong to Jesus, I'm really his follower, then at the least, as a part of my relationship to God, I'm going to pray for people in my circles of influence that they'll open up to know God and they'll care about it, that God will give me the opportunity maybe to tell them a little of my story of what Jesus means to me and the difference he's made in my life. I mean, if it's... A, if you're talking about your eternal soul and there's not a difference in your life, then we need to back up a couple of steps, right? To giving your life to Jesus. But if, if you've had that experience, you want to share that at some simple level. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. Just here's, There was a time in my life when I was far from God, separated from Him by my sin. I, I, I believed in Jesus. I surrendered my life to Him. Now I have this peace. I have a hope. I have this focused purpose. Do you have a story like that? And then I ought to be trained to do this really well and in a simple way be able to say, this is how someone begins a relationship to Jesus. And then I'm going to look for those opportunities. If you're a follower of Christ, at the least, you ought to be praying for people. You ought to have a story to tell. And you ought to be equipped to, to share how someone else can become a fully developing follower of Christ. We're going to share with you just a quick little parable by way of video related to this. Then we'll close out. So come along now and hear the parable of the fishless fisherman's fellowship. The fishermen were surrounded by streams and lakes full of hungry fish. They met regularly to discuss the call to fish, the abundance of fish, and the thrill of catching fish. They got excited about fishing. Someone suggested that they needed a philosophy of fishing, so they carefully defined and redefined fishing. They also developed fishing strategies and tactics. They began research studies and attended conferences on fishing. Some traveled to faraway places to study different kinds of fish with different habits. A few even got doctorates in fishology, but no one had yet gone fishing. So a committee was formed to send out fishermen. As prospective fishing places outnumbered fishermen, the committee needed to determine priorities. A priority list of fishing places was posted on bulletin boards in all the fellowship halls, but still no one was fishing. A survey was launched to find out why. Most didn't answer the survey, but from those who did, it was discovered that some felt called to study fish, a few to furnish fishing equipment, and several to go around encouraging the fishermen. With so many important meetings, conferences, and seminars, they just simply didn't have time to fish. Now, Jake was a newcomer to the Fisherman's Fellowship. After one stirring meeting of the fellowship, he went fishing and caught a large fish. At the next meeting, he told his story and was honored for his catch. He was told that he had a special gift of fishing. He was then scheduled to speak at all the fellowship chapters and tell everyone how he did it. With all the speaking invitations and his election of the board of directors, Jake no longer had time to go fishing. But soon, he began to feel restless and empty. He longed to feel the tug on the line once again. So he canceled the speaking, he resigned from the board, and he said to a friend, hey, let's go fishing. That's exactly what the two of them did. And lo and behold, they caught fish. The members of the Fisherman's Fellowship were many. The fish were plentiful, but the fishermen were few. In Mark 1.17, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. When it comes to evangelism, are you a fisherman who doesn't fish? If that's the case, don't be afraid to follow Jesus. You can trust him. He will make you a fisher of men. So are you a follower of Jesus if you don't follow? That doesn't seem to work out. If you're a follower of Jesus, you follow Jesus. Not self-identifying as, oh, I'm a follower, and by that I mean I sit and I soak. That's not the same thing as following. Are you a follower of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, then you follow Jesus. And there's some, there's some metrics there that are discernible. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to be fishing. Fishing for, for people who need to know Jesus. And that's just a part of this picture. And it's not, it's not a negotiable part. It's not just something that you, you delegate to the pastoral staff or to the deacons or to Sunday school teachers. It's, 
it's a part of the calling for all of us.